want to ask you today, what are you allowing to get into your eye and into your body? Are you the kind of guy that sits around with Maxim magazines reading them because they're interesting to you? I mean, think about it. What's interesting? Are you the kind of guy that when you're watching the television and something comes on, you should probably turn off? Or why are you watching it anyway? You keep looking at it. Are you the kind of guy that clicks on all these things on the internet? And you know what we do? We pray that God would help us. But you know what the Bible says? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. We pray that prayer every day, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We act as if God's going to show up in Brian's room in front of the computer or the TV and break the TV and throw the, the internet out the, out the window or do whatever, but he's not. God's told you and I not to be transformed to this will, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. I shouldn't be around these things. If you have magazines in your house with pornography in them, then it's your fault. If you're looking at things on the internet that you shouldn't be, it's your fault. God's given you grace if you're a Christian and He's enabled you to walk away from this. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. If I'm thinking about pornography, if I'm thinking about women, if I'm thinking about foul things all day, those issues will spring out of me. But the Word's a lamp to my feet. Man doesn't live on bread alone, but every word that precedes the mouth of God. So what am I allowing to get into the temple? Am I now putting myself with prostitutes and harlots? Because Jesus said, if you look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. We like Jesus in so many ways, but do we really like him when he speaks to our heart and convicts and challenges us? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and you might hear his voice, but do you follow him? You're all hearing his voice today, but where is it sticking? We started by Paul writing to the church in Corinth, and we saw that he was telling them, get out of sexual immorality. Stop having sex outside of marriage. Then we see that God saw that it was good in Genesis. And just say you're in a church or in a ministry, all that Paul does throughout Scripture is he writes letters to them. So we're going to look at just two of the letters real quick. He writes to the church in Ephesus, and he starts off in Ephesians 5.3. He says, but fornication and all cleanliness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you. What is fornication? Fornication by definition is adultery. It's looking at anyone with lust in any way and pursuing it. Fornication and uncleanliness. What is uncleanliness? It's impurity. It's the lustful living. It's the motive to get attention, the, the sexual kind of flirting with people. He says, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for the saints. If you're dead in sin, then you're going to enjoy this. But if you're really a saint, you shouldn't be living this way. He says, neither filthiness, listen to me guys, or even some girls, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. You might not be in a sexual relationship with someone you're not married to. You might not be looking at pornography, but you might be the guy that every time you go somewhere, you're making crude jokes, or you're checking out every woman, or you're pointing to every woman. God says don't live this way because we're the saints. We're to live our lives as an example for the kingdom of God. And so if I'm living that way, I thought I'd be standing before you today getting to share this awesome message of Christ's love for us to do with sex, lies, and love. We're not to live that way. He says, for this you know, and this is a big deal, this you know, Christian, as you read your Bible, that no fornicator, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. If you're in Christ and you're truly saved, the awesome thing about God is He convicts us of sin and He convicts us of our righteousness in Him. That means as we live this, as we hear this today, God challenges us and says, you're not living the way I called you to live. I'm not telling you you're sitting there right now, you're not perfect. You're perfect in the image of Christ if you're born again. But the Bible does say that we're being perfected, we're being matured, we're being washed in His way. This message should be ministering to you and making you consider, do I really love Jesus? Is my life about me or is it all about God? He writes another letter to the church in Thessalonians and in 1 Thessalonians 4.3. I love this. I love all Scripture, but I love this right now. He says, for this is the will of God. Lord, what's your will for my life to do with sex and sexual immorality? Here it is. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. So many times I get letters or emails from kids who just, they just have a faith that Christ real, but they don't know Him. And this word sanctification says a lot. This is the will of God, your sanctification. There's, there's three stages in knowing the Lord. When you get born again, you're justified. Christ died for you. He shed His blood. You're washed. 
you're made whole. Then God doesn't take you out here like the thief on the cross. He leaves you here to be washed in His Word, to be filled with the Spirit, and to walk as a witness. As I'm speaking to you today and revealing God's truth, this Word is hitting you and it's sanctifying you. It's showing you how to walk, not in a legalistic way, because God loves you and died for you, but so you'll represent Him on the earth. Then when we finally die or He returns, we're transformed and then we're glorified. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. If you're a Christian, and you're hearing this today, you're being sanctified. When you die, you'll have a resurrected body. And if you don't know the Lord, praise God, I hope today that you get to know Him and you're justified. He says, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality and that each one of you should know how to possess his own vessel, which is your body, your flesh. You and I should know how to walk, how to stay away from this or put our hand up to that or say, I don't need to go here and taste this and touch that. Each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, just like the Gentiles who do not know God. There's a good gauge of where you are. When I go somewhere, is there a difference in the way I speak? Is there a difference in what my head follows? Is there a difference in what I read and what I say? There should be. You should look at the people around you that don't know Jesus and say, is there any different way of lifestyle in the way you live to them? Verse 7, For God did not call us to uncleanliness, but in holiness. Therefore, He rejects this, does not reject man, but God, who has also given us His Holy Spirit. If you don't like this, if you say, Who are you to judge? I'm not judging anyone. I'm letting the Word of God speak, and the Word of God judges those who are guilty and condemns them, or those who are His hear His voice and they get born again. I'm just the mailman. Don't get mad at me or the network. And this is what takes place as people come to church and they say that. Part of their defense is, I'm a pastor's kid, or I did this, or I did that. Who are you to judge? Here's a revelation most people don't understand. The Apostle Paul said, we don't judge those who are outside the church because God's already judged them. It says we judge those who are inside the church. My prayer today is that as I'm saying this to you, God's Word is speaking and ministering. And Corinthians actually says, if you judge yourself by the Word of God, you won't be judged. I'm not going to judge you what God's Word is, but I'm going to speak to you in a loving way as perhaps a big brother or a friend or a fatherly figure to get you out of sexual immorality and get you walk in this relationship with Jesus so we can bear witness. Amen? Here's the main question people get. Why do you say you can't have sex outside of marriage? So if you have a Bible, go to 1 Corinthians 7. I'm going to finish reading through this scripture and then I'm going to pray over us. This is Paul's letter again to the church in Corinth. They've been writing to him saying, can I really not touch a woman? Am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to do that? Why do people keep telling me this, Paul? And here's what he says. 1 Corinthians 7.1. This is the go-to verse. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. The word touch used here doesn't mean knock into her. It doesn't mean give her a hug. It's meant, it's meant in the way that the woman with the issue of blood... She reached out to touch Jesus. She touched him on purpose because she wanted to be healed. She wanted to be saved. He's saying it's not good that a man would reach out to touch a woman in a lustful, in a desiring, in a flirtful way. Concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. It'd be better if you never touched a woman. And now here's how you know he tells you that we need to be married. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, not because of sex, because of sexual immorality, which means wanting to touch a woman and touching her outside of marriage is what sexual immorality is. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. That's it, crystal clear. Then it goes on and says, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her and likewise also the wife the affection due to her husband. You see, what's taking place in this society is men and women are running around, jumping in and out of bed with other people, getting some kind of affection. I love what Ken Hovind used to say. He used to say, if you're not for sale, don't advertise. So many women over the years, just growing up as a young man, would say, well, I dated this guy for two weeks, and then we finally hooked up and he left. How was she dressed? Was it all about cleavage? Was it all about the shape of her backside? Was it all about hair strutting or so to present herself as someone who was sexual? And they finally hooked up and the guy bounced and you said, he played me. No, he didn't. You played yourself. You were presenting yourself this way to get affection. 
my wife and I being remarried, praise God, born again Christians, all the affection she needs in the world is from me. And if we're being physical, if we're being close, if there's a romance, that's the affection that the Bible says is due her. Women, think about it. What are you wearing? What are you dressing like? I have a three-year-old daughter. I'm going to do everything to guide her and pray the Holy Spirit leads and saves her soul and transforms her life so she doesn't go out and sell herself. She doesn't go out and need special affection. She needs to know who she is in Christ and know that God's got a husband for her or not. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. That's a crazy statement right there. What that means is because men, because women, you will want to touch the opposite sex. It's in you. It's something that's built into us the way God made us. Because of that, when you get married, this body is now yours. That means if a woman truly loves her husband, there's submission. She constantly gives herself to him. She's not subject to him. This is just so you men get this. It doesn't mean it's 8 o'clock in the morning and the kids are in the minivan and you say, I need to have sex right now. No. What this means is as they romance each other, as they grow together, as he just ministers to her loving words and kind words like Song of Solomon, and as she's presenting herself to him, this in turn is how sex is meant to be. We know that because of the next verse. It says, do not deprive one another except with consent for a time. God's saying, come together, lay down your bodies, have sex, be close, be physical. There's a union. You are one with the last surname. Come together and don't rob each other. That word for deprive in the Greek means rob. Do not rob each other. Why would God not want that? Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time. The only reason you shouldn't be giving your body to one another consistently is so that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer. Why? To draw near to God. My wife and I maybe need to fast and pray about something. Hey, we're going to hold off from being physical at all for a week or five minutes. Amen? That's what God is saying. The most important thing in your life is God. But after that, between a man and a woman, my wife's my first sheep. It isn't about ministering to you. It isn't about the church. The first person in my life I'm to minister to is my wife. And that means she's the woman I'm meant to desire. I'm meant to pursue. I'm meant to be motivated by. So it gives God glory. And that's where sex is done in the right way. That's without a lie. That's with true love. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and then come together. This gets even crazier. Come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I can't tell you how many times I've been on the road and I've shared my story. Oh, I was divorced. I was suicidal. I'm remarried to the same woman. Praise God. And so many women, particularly women, come up to me, oftentimes elder women, and they say, you know, I've just been going through such a hard time with my husband. I think he wants a divorce. I think he's cheating on me. I think he's doing this. I've been trying everything. And I, I'll make sure there's someone else there with me. But I'll say, you know, have you guys been being close? And she goes, well, no. And I say, why? And she goes, I, I just don't respect him anymore. I said, when you stop living your life in a way that you're giving your body to your husband and you're growing in that relationship, in a sense, you're living as if you are divorced. I'm not saying if he's out on crack or he's beating you or the kids or he's doing something wrong, be laying around the house with him. No, don't just give in for no reason. That's just being subject to him. But so many women don't realize the power they have when they come before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to honor you in this way. And of course it sounds that way because society uses this power that the woman has to control a man and so many men are controlled by it. God says if you don't come together because of your lack of self-control, Satan's going to do something. Maybe he'll have you run into this person from the past. Maybe he'll have you think these thoughts. Maybe he'll throw these fiery darts at you. And then a woman sits back and goes, well, why is he doing that? It's all his fault. But God's also going to say to you or to the man, if you're not being physical with your wife, well, you robbed your wife. You robbed your husband. You didn't come together. There's something sacred. There's something that protects in that situation. Come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Crazy. I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. He's not saying I'm making this statement as a concession. He's saying because not all people are going to be married. I don't say this to everyone because not every person will be married. What do you mean, Brian? He says, well, I wish that all men were even as I myself am. Paul that we know of may have had a wife at some time, but he wasn't married then. He was going to die in just a certain amount of time after this. God had called him to be martyred, really to go to Rome and die. And so, so here he is, and he's saying, I wish you were as I am. 
I wish you didn't need to touch a woman. I wish you didn't need to have sex, but because you're not, I know men and women in our church that feel like they're not called to marry. They have this gift. I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and one in the other. That means that right now watching, you're, you're one of two people with either gift. You either have the gift to be married and God's got a spouse for you. And if it's a woman, wait for him to show up. And if it's a man, seek the Lord and, and pursue that woman when you meet her and romance her and walk in love towards her and honor her. Or you're not at all and you feel a total different call. But here's how you know, because your life is called to bring glory to God. I wish all men were as I am. This is a gift of God. And he says, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, if you can't refrain from touching someone, if you have to get physical, let them marry for it is better to marry than to bear with passion. What he's saying in this passage basically is don't touch a woman because that's sexual immorality. Get married, and when you get married, give your bodies to one another because this is what God wants. And if you need to draw nearer to God, maybe refrain for just a season, but probably not. The whole purpose of this is you coming together, there's a union. You're to lay down together. And he says, some of you are going to have a gift where you don't need a wife, you don't need a husband, but other of you, you will. The call of ministry on your life, I don't know what it is, but the focus is this. You don't have self-control. This is where Satan is going to tempt you the most. All you kids or adults or grandparents, if you're struggling with stuff, God knows where you are, and he just said you have a lack of self-control. It could come back to so many reasons, but remember the Bible says we're going to take the plank out of our own eye. The message today, I'm hoping, is speaking to your heart, and it's ministering to you about where you need to be in the Lord. A couple things I want to close in just saying to you is, Sex is for a couple of reasons. In Genesis 1.28, it says, Be fruitful and multiply. So sex is for children. That's what it's about. Woman came back from the rib to man and brought them together as one. They were naked. They saw that it was good and they laid together. So what sex is also for is oneness. As we get into Song of Song in the next little study, children are never mentioned. So sex is for pleasure. People are afraid of that. What do you mean it's for pleasure? Yes, Sex is for pleasure. Also, the fourth thing is sex is for protection. It just said, because you're going to want to touch someone, get married. It's for protection. What this really says to you and me today is that we can honor God as we take our Bible to church. We can honor God as we say we're Christian or we post on our blogs and our Facebook that we're Christian. But does the way we view sex really line up? Are you sitting here the whole time disagreeing with everything that I'm just saying, God is saying, still feeling like you're such a Christian, but opposed to the Word of God? The way people will know we're a Christian is by living for Him in every area, and He gives us the strength to do that. And maybe in the area of sex, you're struggling. I imagine most of you are. I mean, we just read almost 50% of Christians struggle with pornography. In Romans 1, it says that God gave them over to their own desires, to the wickedness of their hearts. So if you're constantly holding on to the sexual desire, you've just got to know this, that you're called then to be married. If you're struggling with this, you're probably called to have a wife or a husband. So you need to prepare yourself and get ready and be ready to love this person in this way. I want to just close in saying this, that many of you today are single and you're probably having sex and you know by now you shouldn't be. Many of you could be watching and you could be those people that heard me speak just 10, 15 minutes ago about maybe you've been abused when you were a kid or maybe you've had a crazy sexual past. Maybe you're someone that has so many images in your mind from the amount of pornography that you're just addicted to and you need strength to overcome the magazines and the strains and the struggle. You might feel like your life is just so misunderstood because of something that someone did to you years ago and I don't know where you are but I'll tell you something though. Just as I spoke what God says, God Himself knows where you are right now in that room. God Himself knows where your heart is. God Himself knows where your situation is. And what I'm telling you today is, I spoke this word so you can respond. If you don't know Jesus, first of all, you can cry out to Him. He died for you on a cross and He shed His blood and you can encounter Him. If something happened to you from the past, I'll tell you that whatever that person did to you, God can redeem, God can transform. You might be part of the family where there's a curse in the line and everyone around you has been so crude and filthy. There was so much pornography. You've jumped in and out of bed. That needs to stop today. The power of the blood and the Holy Spirit can guide you. You might just be watching this and say, man, I need to delete all this pornography off my computer. Praise God for that. Whatever it is, I just want to pray and I just hope you'll continue on in this study with us. So let's just, let's just go to the Lord today in prayer. I'm just going to speak life over us right now. 
Lord, I just thank you that your word is so alive and your word says that it is good. It's good for a man and a woman to marry because of sexual immorality, to bear children for protection, for oneness, for so many reasons. And Lord, the enemy has done such a good job to just devastate society. He's lied, he's deceived, and he's just caused people to lust and fall into pornography. And there's been abortion after abortion, sexual abuse, rape, all kinds of cases. But Lord, I want to ask you in faith, coming to your throne boldly today, that the people that are watching this right where they are, you speak to their heart. You give them peace from their past and their struggle. You give them guidance and wisdom, Lord. You just put the love of Christ inside them to forgive those people from the past. I just say, set them free in Jesus' name. And Lord, you would just empower my brothers and sisters who are struggling with pornography addiction to, to get away from the magazines, get away from everyone they're checking, them out, checking out, get away from all those situations and trust in you. I just ask for strength, Lord, over our minds today that they would resist the devil, he would flee. Lord, you told, you told Peter that as Satan was coming to sift him as wheat, you were praying. So we know that right now you're at the right hand of the throne of majesty, praying and interceding for us. Lord, I just speak life right now pertaining to everything to do with sex and lies and love over your people. If you receive that in Jesus' name, just say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. I know this was a lot of stuff, but I don't want you jumping all over the place trying to figure out. I want it all in one place. You can get into it. Go back to the verses. Get into commentaries. Seek the Lord and pray and find this truth and just share it with people. He called us to live a life that's a salt and the light. And praise God that you now have revelation and information to go share with people that struggle, oftentimes as you and I did. But as Jesus struggled, he overcame. God bless you guys. I'm Brian Sumner. <laughs>